Hello, I'd like to welcome you to this second national webinar on ensuring diversified and specialty farms. Is USDA's AgriLite insurance right for you? This hour long webinar is presented by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, or NCAT, a nonprofit organization with offices across the United States. My name is Jeff Berkby, and I'm a project manager for NCAT. Through our NCAT Sustainable Agriculture Project, also known as ATRA, we provide extensive information on how to farm more sustainably, including information on crops, livestock, organic certification, farm energy, and many other topics. Today's webinar will debut the web-based version of a new software tool for farmers to assess the usefulness of a federally subsidized whole farm insurance product called Adjusted Gross Revenue Light, or AGR Light for short. The user-friendly software tool makes it easier to understand a unique federally subsidized crop insurance that protects the revenue of a farm rather than the specific commodities produced on the farm. This product is especially useful for farmers who grow diverse crops and livestock and for those for whom alternative insurance options may not be available. AGR Lite may also be useful for organic farmers and those with unique specialty crops or livestock. The tool is a culmination of a four-year project supported by the United States Department of Agriculture's Risk Management Agency, or RMA. We at NCAT are grateful to RMA for their financial support of the development of the software tool and their support for this webinar. And now a couple of housekeeping tips before we get started with the webinar. During the hour-long webinar, you'll be able to type in questions in the box on the side of your computer screen. We'll review these questions during the hour and then try to get through as many questions as possible during a Q&A session with our presenter at the end of the webinar. We'll probably spend 10 or 15 minutes on the Q&A during the um, after session. One thing to keep in mind also is if you miss anything during the webinar, keep in mind that the entire presentation will be archived on our ATRA website, including the slides and the audio, so you can watch it at your leisure. And the ATRA website, um, URL web address will be flashed on the screen, but it's atra, A-T-T-R-A dot N-C-A-T dot O-R-G. So keep that in mind if you miss anything. The presenter for today's webinar is Jeff Shazinski, who's an ag economist with the National Center for Appropriate Technology. Jeff has a wide range of interests and expertise, including organic and sustainable agriculture marketing and economics, conservation policy, organic horticulture, farm energy economics, and even beekeeping. Jeff has graduate degrees in agriculture economics and political science and served in the Peace Corps in Belize, as well as worked many summers on his grandfather's dairy farm in Wisconsin. Jeff also has a variety of academic and nonprofit experience, and he currently serves as council member for the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. With that, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you to kick off the webinar. Uh, thank you, Jeff, um, and welcome, everyone. Um, today we are, are going to um, have a, I'm going to start with a very brief uh, overview of kind of the place of AGR Lite and the whole pantheon of crop insurance products available. And then mostly I'm going to try to focus on demonstrating the new tool that we have, are, are, are uh, putting out very, very, very recently. And, uh, and it's an online version of a tool that we've already have had out um, that's based on a PC version. So this is the new, the new, a new tool that you can access through the, the web. But, but um, as I will say later, you can access this assessment tool in either case. So first I'll do this background with crop insurance. Um, and I'm really going to try to point out why uh, adjusted gross revenue light is a distinct and kind of unique kind of insurance. I am going to explain and try to talk a little bit about what are some of the advantages and barriers to its use for farmers. Um, and again, like I said, de demo the assessment tool and then hopefully we'll have some, uh, plenty of time for questions at the end. And again, just to, to reiterate our sponsors, this is the National Center for Appropriate Technology, our ATRA project program, and USDA, of course. One I should have really put here as a project partner is, the, is Montana Tech of the University of Montana, who actually were extensively involved in the uh, programming of both these tools. Um, it's a great undergraduate college for those who want to do computer science or software engineering. That's just a plug for them. They, a lot, of, a lot of students helped and worked on this project. 
so crop insurance in general, I just did some of the basics. Um, crop insurance is federally subsidized by the, the federal government. And it ranges in the degree of subsidization anywhere from 38 to 50% uh, depending on the product and, and the amount of liability coverage. Um, most people think of crop insurance with the word crop. They're, therefore, they're thinking, you know, I am protecting a specific crop. And if this slide that I have up is what is insured, gives you a, a, an overall sense of the magnitude of the total liability that these programs are, are, are insuring on an annual basis. And this is of, as of 2011, so it's fairly current. And you can see we have crops. We have corn, soybeans, wheat, cotton, nursery crops, actually, which is interesting, um, citrus and rice. These are the major crops that represent most of the liability coverage covered. Now, in the United States, in fact, if you take the uh, corn, soybean, wheat, and cotton, you're, you're almost having up to 76% um, of all the liability coverage are, are on those, focusing on those four crops. AGR light is actually in the category down there called all others, uh, which is actually, when you take them together, is a significant per percentage of the liability coverage as well. All others also include, besides AGR light, other individual crops that are just a smaller number, like cherries and fruits and some vegetables um, and some fruit trees and, 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 and very a, a number, quite a large number actually of other specialty crops they're, they're referred to uh, and, and they represent a significant amount. The other thing that's important to know is that crop insurance can be based, most of, it is, most of them are based on a crop and they're either provide revenue coverage or what's called multi-parallel or yield protection, um, which means that, you know, this is take corn because it's easy and it's, it's the one that's most used. So you can get corn insurance, for instance, on, the, on, on, on basically protecting yield variability of your corn crop. So basically it's trying to protect you from any crashes that are that affect yield, which could be uh, uh, weather, fire, insects, disease, wildlife, uh, the number of you know the insurable causes of, of a loss to yield, and then it basically covers some of that uh, losses that you have based to yield. You also have revenue law, revenue insurance, which adds the other factor of uh, that it can affect the value of a crop and let's say corn is a volatile price change. I mean, we're really benef benefiting right now from very high corn prices, for instance, but if that were to crash down to 350 a bushel, and it's something I think like $7 a bushel now, you know, that would be a tremendous immediate loss to farmers. And you can, through revenue-based insurance, crop revenue insurance, you can pick that up. AGR light is significantly different. In fact, it's so different. I, I'll keep saying this over its whole farm, first of all, which means it covers the entire products of the farm. So it's, they could be, and that could be a very, very diverse farm. It could have some, some livestock products. It could have some, some crop products. It could have any of these products. In fact, it could even be, corn could be part of it, but it's protecting the revenue of the farm and not just the crop. Um, which is very distinctive and very unique in, in, in very different than, than almost all other insurance policies offered through uh, federalized crop insurance. AGR also often gets lumped with specialty crop insurance. Uh, and this is just, uh, the, this is the, uh, uh, the federal um, Crop Insurance Corporation, which is manages the risk management agency uh, programs. And again, this is again liability, the coverage uh, amounts for the various years 2000 through 2009. This is fairly recent data, but it's basically, at, if you remember that 15% of liability that was put on that first slide, this is kind of a little bit more of a breakdown of that 15% of other. And it's broken down by fruit trees, nursery, crops again, uh, vegetables, and uh, adjusted gross revenue, which is what we're talking about today. And you can see that adjusted gross revenue is a very small uh, um, amount, it's a very relatively small program compared to other specialty crops. So by specialty crops, let's take something like blueberries, for instance. There are places in the United States where you can get blueberry insurance for blueberries rather than, than corn. And they're very very much the same as in that they are based on, uh, on either uh, multi-parallel 
or uh, well actually they are all multi-para which means they're all yield protection there's only a few cases where you can actually get specialty crop revenue protection and they're very very new new product, product products too um, and but adjusted gross revenue again is this whole farm thing but you can see there hasn't been a large increase in the use of AGRL over time and, and that was part of the this project this project is both a research project and a kind of outreach education project as well and so we actually did a lot of work uh, not only developing this tool but also trying to understand um, what is good about the product and what why people like it and what are the, some of the issues about use about its use and I hope I'll get to the next slide here okay uh, the limits of specialty crop um, this is to take tomatoes uh, one of the problems with, with having a specialty crop insurance is that it's only offered in certain counties in the United States. And as you can see, this is, this is the 2011 program for tomatoes. So let's say you were in Wisconsin somewhere, and you can see there's no green there for Wisconsin. And you, for whatever reason, your farm has been moving in the direction of really specializing in tomato production. You, would have, you wouldn't have a tomato multi peril insurance policy to insure those. You would for corn and other things because they are available in those counties, but but especially crops also have their limits because they are only being offered in places where there's a, a, a usually is a high percentage of tomatoes being grown, and, and that actually you can make some sense if you think of a of the uh, the agricultural the famous agricultural valley of California where a lot of the tomatoes in fact are grown, but. Actually, New Jersey, which is the home of Campbell's Soup, also has a, still grows quite a few tomatoes. The point here being that in some cases, so if you were here in Wisconsin and you really had a lot of specialty crops, i.e. not the major commodity crops, you, you might be looking at whole farm because whole farm AGR light, because that would be one way you could actually have an opportunity to provide coverage uh, for, your, for your production. And the, the unfortunate thing too is uh, adjusted gross revenue light is not available in all states in the United States. Uh, this, the green is where it is available. And, um, and we may have some discussion about that. And there was, uh, this program has been going on for quite a while and states and regions have been added as it goes along and whether there will be additional um, uh, AGR light available in other states is still an open question. So, um, I am going to go to the next slide here too. Uh, there's also a companion, um, very much as the other whole farm insurance product is called adjusted gross revenue. And the only difference, the main difference between adjusted gross revenue and adjusted gross revenue light is the size of the liability coverage. AGR light is for gross revenue of $2 million or less. And above that, it is for it is you can go to an adjusted gross revenue uh, whole farm policy, but again there's limited coverage for whole farm adjusted revenue revenue, uh, i.e. those with higher liabilities, and it is kind of interesting to see where those are. Um, again, you're going in places probably where you have farms that are fairly diverse but with higher value, potentially higher value crops. So uh, I could see in here, for instance, perhaps some of the high-end seed production that goes on in terms of turf seed, uh, very high valuable crops, and there's a variety of them. It might be some of the logic as to why it's uh, it's being offered there um, rather than other words. So, so there is very limit to, to the use of whole farm and even HR light for that matter to the specific places where it's available. Again, so a AGR light is whole farm revenue based. In order to be able to calculate a premium and to uh, to um, to um, a set to essentially sign up for this program, you do need to use tax forms. Tax forms is basically the basis upon which the the uh, risk management agency can document, or your insurance company, I should say, can do document the in fact revenue gross revenue of the farm because it's uh, on on your tax forms. It's really mostly the one that's the most important line on your Schedule F is the one that's it's you know your gross sales in, of, of products and livestock, which is really the the data that is used to estimate premiums. Uh, and again, it ensures revenue, not specific crops or livestock. So that's really important. Uh, it, it is important to highlight some of the reasons and why we got involved in this program, why it is not utilized. The first one is, of course, is that the tax data is sensitive. Um, 
we actually found that for the from, from the studies that we did with farmers that we interviewed that it wasn't so much the tax that using tax forms was an issue as much as it was just going and getting the tax forms out of the closet to be able to enter the data because you have to enter data way back to like 2006 and so you have to find all your tax forms that sometimes can be a burden burden in itself but the other issue is how accurately and uh, does your tax record really reflect your true revenue and i'm not going to go into <laughs> to people hiding uh revenue from the federal government but it could happen and, and it may again that's part of the sensitivity as well people that that often are selling in a cash market and an accurate accounting of their sales then they don't report it properly on their anyway i'm not going there but that's is one the part of the sensitivity uh, issue um, Buying the product is more complicated and time consuming. It, it's partly complicated and time consuming because it's so different, because it is based on, on revenue. And, and a lot of insurance agents um, have not had the history of uh, writing up an HR life policy. And so their tendency is to be a little bit leery about it. They, they, everyone is uncomfortable when they're not used to something. And there's a, such a long and strong history of the other insurance types, and this whole farm is new. That, that it's difficult. It also is somewhat complicated to, to think about eligibility issues, which is actually why we did this product project. This project really has helped, and I would argue has really eliminated this as being um, a significant barrier to people using AGR Lite. The next barrier is the premium costs may be too high for the, for the loss coverage provided. One way to think of this is like a deductible, um, and I will get uh, show this more clearly later on. But uh, basically, there's a high level of deducti uh, uh, deductible on, on these policies, meaning you can suffer a fairly significant loss before you get any kind of indemnity or repayment on your insurance. And some farmers who evaluated felt that the coverage wasn't significant enough, that the deductible was in fact too high to make it worth. The other barrier is often the diversity is often a form of insurance itself. So if you have a very highly diverse farm, let's say with 40 different crops and maybe three or four different livestock products who you think would be ideal for this insurance product, they may not be as interested because their diversity, their diversity actually is their protection. They're, they're, there's an expectation by that farmer that, that only if they lose one or two crops and there's only 40 crops, they can either replant, they can do something else to make up, they can sell more of the other thing or charge maybe a little higher for the other product. And they don't feel that they necessarily need an insurance because their diversity protects them. Now, that of course is a little bit dangerous because there are events, um, for instance, in the north, Northeast this year when we have major floods, a hurricane, and the entire crop is worked out and there's no way to get back, you know, you know, to, to offset your diversity because everything is gone, then of course the, having this insurance would have been very, very, very valuable. Um, and many farmers just simply do not know about it. They, they just, again, they, they know about crop-based insurances, but the whole farm is like this new concept, even though it's been around for a while. And there's been a lot of outreach, both by RMA, and we did a lot of outreach over these last four years, but it's still not that widely known. And the final thing, it's not for beginning farmers. A lot of beginning farmers are fairly diverse farms, and, and unfortunately, you need uh, several years of history uh, in I believe in, yeah, 2011, you have to go back to 2006 records. So to buy it for 2012, you'd have to go all the way back and have records documenting your farming uh, income uh, on your uh, tax forms, your Schedule Fs, back to 2006. So if you haven't been farming that long, you have to wait till you've been farming that long to be able to be eligible for the product. The other uh, advantage of uh, whole farm AGR Lite is... Uh, uh, is, is an issue around organic agriculture. We here at NCAT and Atra, we worked a lot with organic farmers and there's been several complaints uh, by organic farmers with risk management agency about crop insurance. One of them is there's a lack of emission about the, associated with this uh, 5%. There's a, currently there's on most crops insured by RMA, there's a 5% surcharge if you're an organic uh, farmer. And the logic is that, um, 
RMA is still considering for many product, for many, for many uh, crops that uh, they, there's a higher risk to growing organically than not. Now I know many organic farmers, if they're on the call and I've talked to many organic farmers in this project, you know, they, they would argue, no, we're not any more riskier than, than, than a conventional farmer. Uh, but, and there's been a lot of, of, of people interested in changing. In fact, there's been so many interested in changing it. It is beginning to change now. Uh, in fact, um, as of 2011, and this is very, very recently, organic corn, soybean, cotton, and, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm reading the wrong list here. Um, the surcharge is a limit on these 10 crops. I'm sorry, I'll get to the other point later. Is figs, Florida citrus, Florida fruit trees, uh, macadamia trees, nursery crops, pears, peppers, prunes, Texas citrus tree, and Texas citrus fruit. So for those organic crops, there is no surcharge any longer, but that's just recently of 2011. That's a very, fairly limited and fairly somewhat obscure crops. I don't know how many figs we grow in the United States, but maybe it's significant. I don't know. It's interesting. But um, anyway, th those don't have a 5% surcharge. Uh, and there's also the, the point I messed up a little bit there is that there's limited price selection. Uh, if you have revenue insurance, you actually are, and even yield insurance, you're actually calculating your losses based on a estimated price, and that's called a price election. And the price election currently, or at least historically, uh, for conventional crops or for special crops for that matter, were not the organic value, not their organic value, but the conventional price in some conventional market. So you, wouldn't, you weren't able to fully um, get insurance for the true value of your crop because in general, organic crops tend to be higher value. And therefore, if you have losses, you should suffer loss and therefore be compensated. At least that's what organic growers grow, uh, organic growers say. So that, that IRMA has been listening to this. And so now as of, 19, of 2011, this, this list is, is where there is price selection where you can actually have an organic value uh, of to your to your crop being in part of your insurance, and this is being uh, offered for in 2011 was offered for organic corn, uh, soybean, cotton, and processing tomatoes. So for those crops, again, you can use an organic price selection. So there's some effort. The exception, though, however, which I've always pointed out through this entire program, is AGR light, adjusted gross revenue light, can already capture the value of organic of organic production, which I think is one of its big advantages for organic farmers, particularly that are, are more diverse, because it because you are basically insuring revenue, and if your revenue is based on organic prices, then you're insuring already that extra revenue that you have gotten because of your organic value and therefore you are covering your organic value, which is a big advantage. So this is, is actually the exception to the rule around our, this organic issue. And here's just some contact information. Um, again, this is, uh, this is the NCAT and, and our, our folks, but now I'm going to really move to the HR Light Wizard. The HR Light Wizard is, um, and I'll go to that uh, program if I can. You know, I, you, I was going to try to get to the, but we'll we'll go this way. I think we'll get there either way. Oh, technology! How can I get to them? I can't see it. Uh, we're having a bit of a trouble getting to the to the link that I was trying to get to. So, here we go. That'll work. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> Online tools have been my life for the last year and uh, always have been, have been really good at it myself. I'm not a great techie. This would be the first, uh, you go to that web, that URL that, you, that I, I clicked on. And again, we, you have that available on the website and through any way you can get, you get to this URL. And this is when you first, this is the first thing you would see as you, you come up. And it basically is the introductory page. It has a lot of information about the, the project and about some of the basic, the basic ideas you can see. And we as creating an account. This is an online tool. So you, you basically are doing it via the web. Um, 
However, I just want to make clear um, that we do have CD versions of this. So if, if for whatever, if you don't have high speed internet, if you're not comfortable working in an internet environment like me, then, then you can always get a CD version like the old fashioned way and you can load it onto your computer and you can play with this exact same tool at home on your computer. In fact, we have been giving and dispersing, I think over 2000 of these CDs already uh, nationwide. And so we have more. So. Uh, you can just call us and uh, and uh, get that at that one eight hundred number, or however you want to get it. But I'm going to go log on uh, to an account. Um, well, actually, maybe I should show you uh, basically about how you would create accounts. So the first thing you would do after reading this and deciding you want to play with this tool is you would go create an account. And and I will go through this here. It's as easy to go through here as as, as we could as we could later. What we decided with this is that we decided that it would be a good idea to um, First, check for eligibility. In the early design of this of this tool, both the CD uh, PC version and this version, um, we we would this was this this whole tool was designed by farmers from the very beginning, tested with farmers. And in fact, there was years of work with farmers to make this as user friendly for farmers as possible. And farmers told us one thing: we're busy people. We don't want to play around with even these. Great tools that you create, Jeff, but we, and, unless we're eligible and we really something we can use. And so we didn't really think about this, but we decided that eligibility should be the first thing you get over with. If you're obviously, if you're not in a state where it's available or you're simply not eligible for it, there's no sense in using the tool. So with the online account, we decided there's no sense in creating an account to use, utilize a tool until you're eligible. Uh, now, if you're in a state where you're not eligible, you can just fake it and get in and play with it. So if that's what you want to do, that's fine too. But, but basically the idea was, you know, there's no sense in bothering really using it if you're not going to be able to get it in the end. So these are the basic eligibility requirements. You have to be a farmer, yes. Is your adjusted OCRIM like to be over 2 million? Again, this is the difference between AGR Lite and AGR. And so if, you, if it is over 2, two million, you, you would say, um, you'd say yes, and it would, it would say you're not eligible. So let's say if I said yes, um, it would say, see, you're not, but you may be eligible for something else. All right, so let's go no. We have to go no or we won't be eligible. Are you a citizen? Yes. Um, these are pretty basic. Uh, and now this is where we check as to whether it's available in your state. And um, I will just take a state that I know, for instance, that um, it is available in uh, Hawaii and select a county in Hawaii, which are cool, Maui. And it's the, I'm still eligible because Hawaii does have the program and in, in, in Maui County even has the program. And have you scheduled, uh, filed a Schedule F? Again, you need these Schedule Fs and they need to go back to 2006 through 2010 to be able to estimate a premium. This is back to that beginning farmer. So you have to say yes. And or equivalent we'll discuss a little bit later. Do you expect more than half of your 2012 production income to come from products produced for resale? And uh, if I said yes, it said, basically the idea here is that if you're buying corn and then bringing it on your farm and reselling it, you're really in the business of marketing corn. You're not in the building of producing corn. That's the basic logic here. And so up to a certain extent, some of that is done by a lot of farmers and it, it, and it basically says more than half. So, so, but basically it's saying if you're mostly a, just a retail kind of pass-through organization, you really are insuring the crop. You're not insuring a business of uh, reselling corn. So again, that's an eligibility. The potatoes is a federal uh, crop insurance corporation um, detail. It's, it's an interesting history, but anyway, basically uh, if you were growing potatoes, let's say you are, it's gonna ask you another question. And this is again, back to a requirement of the federal, it's a, kind of one of these strange government things. Uh, has to do with potato growers, but basically if you have a significant amount of potatoes, it's probably likely you should be looking at potato insurance anyway, but there is this eligibility requirement it's in the statute. So we have to put it in there as eligibility. So if you expect to do more than 83%, you're really a potato grower, but I'll say no. So I can still go on, I can still grow potatoes. I just can't be only potatoes basically. And basically that made, makes me eligible. So I've cleared the eligibility. Now, now in our logic is now it makes sense to actually get a, a, a password to be able to access this tool 
in the future and everything will be saved later on. I'm not going to create a Chris, but you create your own username, password. Many of you have used internet for banking and other things, know about this kind of uh, way it's done, your email, where you're going to send. And they have these security code things that drive me crazy because sometimes they're not really the capitalization, but you got to get it right. Then you'll create an account and what it will happen is it'll send you an email message back to this email and then you click on there and it'll actually verify you. This is to a security protection thing. But actually, I'm going to go back to the home page here and I'm going to just log on since I already have actually several accounts on here that I play around with all the time. Hopefully, I'm going to go back to the home page. Yeah, there we are. Okay, so I'm going to I am going to go here and, and log on now as me so I can demonstrate some of this tool, this tool for you. All right. So if you remember my spelling of my name, you can at least get my username there. But you won't be able to see this. This is hidden. Okay, and I'm going to log in. So again, I've already created my account. Everybody wants to save your passwords too all the time. So I am actually going to a different point in the tool where you would come in if you were actually using the first time. If you came in the first time, there would actually be a couple early pages, again, leading you into this point. And basically, this works on creating profile. And you can think of a profile. If you're just doing it for your farm, you'll just probably have one, one profile. However, if you want to... <laughs> use the same tool with your neighbors, you could enter their farm in here, or you could make fake farms and play with it. I mean, it's a, it's a very fun, I have fun playing with it all the time. And I create up all, as you can see, I already have three on this account from different places uh, around the country that I've been playing with. And um, so you could, if, and, and if you have two farms, you could put two farms separately. Um, so, or you could put, like I say, make up a, a hypothetical farm uh, to, to play with it. Um, but you would create a new profile in that case, and it would lead you through how to create that new profile. Um, I, actually, we could go, well, no, I better not go there because it'll just take some more time. But basically, you could create another farm by simply hitting this create new profile. If you were coming in for the first time, it would take you to, 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 to early pages where you would actually establish this profile. I'm just gonna load a profile, which is where you basically would end up anyway. Just for demonstration purposes, this uh, just saves time to be able to keep this within a reasonable time frame for you guys to, to, to see. Now, it also brings me in where I last was here, and I was actually looking at flukes or things happening, usually will bring you back to where, where you um, uh, were and you can see up here too some things I haven't pointed out. There's always this information. There's a help, and help is usually related to the page you're on. Uh, I'm going to go back to tax history just to go through the whole process. You can see this actually. If any of you have used TurboTax um, for your tax accounting, um, uh, and, you know, filing your taxes, we we did definitely steal the general idea of having this progressive progressive thing. You know, so you know where you. So Schedule F's that will actually be the basis of calculating a premium. This tool calculates the premium, and it and, and it then allows you to do some what we call loss scenarios. It tells you coverage, gives you a coverage level of choice, tells you a loss scenario. We can play with loss scenarios, which is which is really the fun part of the tool, where you can actually play a what if kind of game, and then it has some reports that you can take to your insurance agent. We're not selling this insurance. This is not the basis of selling the insurance. As you see, it, it is, it is uh, it's for estimation purposes. Any figures are not, are subject to change if you go to your uh, thing. However, if you enter the correct data in here, it will ca calculate an accurate premium. If that data is correct and it's verified by your insurance agent as they're writing up your policy, the the premium and the, and the, and the, and the, and the and it will be accurate. Um, is that as much as the data is accurate. But let's go in here anyway, just to show you how this works. So I have to get my 2006 Schedule F. And you can really, this is really transparent. I mean, you don't need to know why the insurance wants, the, the premium calculator that's in this wants these numbers. Just 
go to your schedule F, find line three. If it's zero, put zero. If it's some other number, put that there. Uh, there's reasons why they need to be there, but you don't need to know them. It's kind of like TurboTax. You don't need to know everything about the IRS tax code to, to use TurboTax. But this is probably the one that will be most used because it really is the basis of your gross revenue. It's, it's the sale of livestock, produce, grains, which is line four on a Schedule F. Now here's the adjustment issue and the, um, if you do not have a Schedule F, this tool is less easy to use. It's not impossible to use, but what you have to do is you have to take whatever kind of tax form schedule you use to, to, to do your taxes and convert it to a Schedule F. I'm told accountants and it's fairly easy to do this. So you can basically take your other tax records and convert them to a Schedule F format and then put them in here. It's a little extra burden, I know, but we decided to go with Schedule F because it's by far the predominant way in which farmers um, uh, file their tax forms. The ad other adjusted value has to do with a very important part, why it's called adjusted gross revenue. Adjusted gross revenue means you have to make an adjustment because it's only insuring the crop in the field, not any extra value you might add to that crop after it leaves the field. The ease and easy, uh, there's, there's some hard, harder examples, but the easiest example I always use is apple and applesauce. If you're growing apples and you get revenue from apples, then you basically are selling those apples to people or wholesale retail uh, or directly to consumers and you get a sales value for that and that's what becomes part of your tax forms. And that's fine because that's the value of your apple crop. But if you, if you take those apples and on your farm, you have the ability to process them to applesauce and put them in nice little jars, you know, the value added agriculture that everybody's so excited about, which is great. Um, that cannot be part of the sales value. So you have to basically go backwards and take out the value of your applesauce. You have to take out the value that's added by that and, and take that out and go back to the sales value of the apples minus the applesauce. So let's say you only do a little bit of applesauce. You just kind of have to work backwards and strip out that. And the logic here is this isn't crop insurance, even though it's whole farm, it's for crop production, not for applesauce prediction insurance. And in fact, in a way you can kind of see the logic that applesauce production is actually a, um, a matter of, uh, of a kind of a business, the business of making applesauce. And perhaps you need insurance for, for applesauce production for various reasons, but that's separate from this insurance. And that does cause problems. And we've evaluated farmers who've had to take that back and it's doable. You usually have to work with your accountant and, and your records and try to get back to that actual value and that's where you would use this adjustment button and it would basically use the adjusted values rather than the values. And that could, that would work its way through all of these other things too. That's probably one of the more difficult um, elements to, to getting this data in, uh, one of the more frustrating. But again, most people are not in that situation necessarily of having these added value. So you just go year by year by year putting the data in. I've already done it, so I don't have to go through this. And then you'll get to this last thing called the income summary. And this is a farm. I've entered this data because this is farm that is actually based on real historical data. So it's not just totally concocted out of my head. It's actually from uh, the University of Minnesota and uh, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture does a great project on organic farming where they're actually tracking farmers' expenses and income over the last uh, few years. In fact, the exact same years as this is that's why I'm using it. And what these are are the average of about, depends on the year, about 20 to 40 uh, organic farms in Minnesota. So these are really based, they're not a particular farm, but they're based on an average of, of those 20 to 40 farms. So it's, um, you know, they're realistic numbers, basically what I'm arguing here. And they actually are. So, so one thing you can just see from this, which is, which I think is nice about the tool in it itself, even as a kind of just a financial planning tool, is you can see the variability in income. You can see that this farmer over time, you know, he's had a little higher and then he's had bad years. You know, this is, this is farming, right? Farming is, we wish it was always going up every single year. We all wish we were making more and more money every year, I'm sure. But uh, agriculture is a risky business and, it, it, and there's generally fluctuations. The interesting thing about the, the average Minnesota organic farm, 
uh, has been at least trending upwards, uh, even though they had a couple bad years. Actually, 2009 was a really particularly bad year, I think, for all of agriculture in Minnesota. And this is basically the average allowable income that will be based on for the calculations. You can also view this in a larger graph form here. So, so you, cool. It's just little added tools we have for making things easier to see. Um, oops. Oop, yeah, continue to production. Okay, now you're going to say, so in 2012, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy AGR Lite. And one of the things you have to do, it's a bit of bit of a burden, but you need to do it, is you need to put your intended production into this format. And I have already done it here um, for the 2012 crop year. Uh, again, to save time. And this is again based on basically this is based on the 2011 data more or less. I jiggered it around a little bit just to to make it a bit different than it than it was than it would have been for 2011. But but anyway, it it, it you can see it's a um, it's a very interesting farm too. These farms that they use in Minnesota are. Are organic farms, but so they're specialty. You know, again, they're incorporating the organic value here, but they um, are relatively fairly conventional crops. But again, you could just put in here green peppers, you know, uh, and and here's how you do it basically. Let's say I was going to grow something else this year. I will want to add another co commodity, and basically, when you start, there's nothing there, and you ha start adding commodities. So this is basically how you do it. You go to here, and then you have all these commodities from which to choose. Now it's very interesting to see, and this is probably the value of AGR Lite, is that is that you can see here the wide range of crops that are insurable under AGR Lite. You probably will not be able, for instance, find I know you won't be able to find blackberry insurance in Minnesota in Blue Earth County, which is the county we're using, but uh, under AGR Lite you could be growing blackberries in Blue Earth County. Um, uh, Minnesota, and that value could be entered in here at its organic blackberry value, and you would actually have it as part of the revenue of the farm, therefore insured by AGR Lite. And um, this is probably one of its single biggest advantages, AGR Lite, is that it covers a far wider array of um, types of crops than you can buy either specialty crop for or um, that are just available for insurance. So it, again, because it's whole farm and you notice it has all the, uh, I mean, even aquaculture, you know, he has all the livestock in here, furs, game birds. I mean, uh, some very interesting, very diverse things can be included in here, mink. And then even this, there is these other categories like other crops. So if you don't, if that pantheon isn't big enough for you there, you can always just put other crop and you can write in an, in this description here a better description of what that other crop is. Let's say it's, I don't know, um, some kind of huckleberry that just knew that never came, you know, can't grow huckleberries really. But, but anyway, you know, you could put that in there and put other vegetables or other fruit and you could actually put in its value and it create another crop here and that would be added to the list that and I'm going to cancel this just because I want to save some time. So let's look at one of these and you can go back and edit this at will too so if you make input errors or whatever you can play with this a little bit and keep changing it. So we have here corn and I just made an extra description this is organic corn. This farmer is going to do 60 acres of organic corn. I, he's predicting his yield be 127 bushels per acre and he's thinking that he's going to get $7 uh, and eight cents per bushel. Okay, and that's how that would be cal calculated there. Again, it's already there, so I'm not going to change it at this point, but you could change it at this point. I'll just close it for now. And so we do the same thing with oats, uh, soybeans, alfalfa hay. Um, these are all the crops that these, this farm is, is going to grow. And you can see that the total value of that crop, of, of, their, of the production next year, the gross revenue, is, is estimated to be $250,472. And now you need to pick coverage. Now, first it gives you this uh, overall thing to look at. I think is really nice. It uh, it shows you the allowable income, you know, that was from the previous year average, and then you get this very nice graph, which actually shows you the estimated AGR, the adjusted gross revenue. Now, this is interesting and a little bit complex, but. Um, one factor that people complained about, and so there's a little bit of a wiggle room here, is that well, if you're a beginning farmer, let's say, and you're, you know, you ha you started here and you're rapidly moving up, you're if you're only going to cover your average 
adjusted gross revenue, it's not going to necessarily reflect your current year because your current year may in fact be higher because really you weren't doing so good those years, you know. Of course, why you weren't doing so good could be because of weather, other reasons too that are insurable, so that's why it needs to be there. But they did allow this index factor. So if in the last few years you start to be going up, they have this indexed factor and basically you can um, – it, it kind of fudges it upwards. So it basically, it's you see the average is actually there, but you're, you, what you're calculating is a little bit higher. So basically, it's saying, okay, um, it actually takes, you know, this could be, this is the index factor one. It usually takes the lower of the two. And so basically, you're here is where you're actually thinking you're going to be is going to be your estimated AGR lead. And that's going to be a key number from which the premium is calculated. And again, you have a larger graph. and can look at this stuff. I think the graphs are really... Now, the other issue is, remember I talked about multi peril or yield-based insurance. You can combine insurance products with AGR and AGR Lite. That means you can, you could paste, maybe like you're going to take the organic corn election. You could take the organic corn election and get that under, like say, corn revenue insurance for organics, and you're going to just take the corn separately and buy a policy separately, and then you're going to have some liability for that. And you put that number in here. And, it, and then for the rest of the farm, you're going to be use AGR light. And what it, will that do? Of course, it will immediately lower your uh, AGR light premium because basically you've taken out the corn risk out of the whole farm. But it, it, it's a nice way to combine two. And this is basically where you would put the liability coverage from those other products here. And it automatically transparents to so you will recalculate the pay, premium based on the other crops. And we're going to get to something called the loss inception point. And I'm not going to read all of this. I know you really need to play with it to get the full understanding. But basically, this is, you could think of again back to deductibility. There's going to be this, you're not going to get full coverage of your, your average gross revenue. You're going to get some percentage of it. And at some point, though, you will actually go, you will start to get paid back. You will hit the, the liability. The liability, you know, like an insurance will be paid off first. You'll hit zero, and then you'll start to get some indemnity for your loss payment. And that's really where that loss inception point is. It's the point at which you're basically the 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 um, you're, you're basically hitting where you're back. You're, you're zero, and you um, your uh, deductible has been met, so to speak. Another way to think of it. And now we're going to have coverage levels. You can see you have various combinations of coverage level, and of course they affect premium. And there's no way, you know, it's like saying how much insurance, it, it, this is a common problem with all insurances, right? I mean, how much coverage do you want? Uh, you can, lower coverage you take, of course, the lower the premium. The higher coverage you take, the higher the premium. And also the loss inception point changes. So the, the point at which you start to get some repayment is, is different for the different levels of coverage. Uh, and so you can play with all of these many times over and, and try to, what, what makes your budget, what you think your risk factors are. There's no really easy answer. I always tend to take the max anyway, and just to get you, but here even the max, you can see, um, this is what the estimated premium for that one will be. And this is the place in which you'll start. So you have to have suffered a significant loss below $200,000 before you start to get any payment. That's the deductible level. And you can see one way to think of this is you get an 80% coverage of your gross for average gross revenue, but you get paid at 90%. The effective coverage at the highest level, therefore, is around 72%. It's really multiplying these two numbers together. Eight times nine is 72. The 72%, uh, so 28% loss really before you start to see any repayment for your insurance. And this is a controversial issue, but this is one of the issues that many farmers say the deductible is really too much and it's not enough coverage for, um, for the cost of that premium. So now we estimate your premium, which is really going to be that same estimated producer premium, but it gives you a nice full screen here. Again, this is the estimated AGR lights based on the coverage level you chose, the payment rate. This is the subsidy rate. So if you were in the free market and uh, this is the actual, true actual cost, this is what the government, the federal government is paying to subsidize your insurance. And you have to pay this administrative fee. Everyone has to pay it. So this is what your producer premium. And as I said before, if you put that data in accurate, you know, accurately in, and it's the real data from your real records, that really will be your producer premium. But again, this tool isn't perfect, so you need to go through the insurance agent to make sure. 
and you can try in other coverage levels and see how that comes out. Now we're going to go to the, I think is the most fun part. I hope I'm not getting too late on time here. I want to get done fairly soon so we can stay more or less within the hour. You can start to play the what if game. And I think this is the most interesting part. You can say, for instance, you could edit this and you could say, um, you know, uh, I'm expecting, oh, what, what really happened, uh, you know, is I didn't get that yield and the price dropped and I had a loss. And this will basically calculate all that and say, do you or not get an indemnity payment? Now, I'm going to load a, a scenario and you can do these scenarios and you can play games like I've done things where like you take the history of the farm and you say, what was my lowest price that I ever received for any of these crop, put it in there and expect it's going to be a really price bad year. You can, you can say it's really going to be a bad yield year. I took my lowest historical yield, put it all in there, see if I would get an indemnity payment under the program or any variation in between. And you can play what if game forever. Um, if those who really like toys, they can probably <laughs> really have fun with this. But I'm going to edit one just so I don't have to, you know, go through the whole process of, of doing it. And I'm going to call it the wheat and soybean wreck. Um, and I'm going to load that scenario. And this is pop up here. So here we go. Um, this is my what if. I had a really bad year for my soybeans and my wheat. And actually, we'll go look at these. And basically, what it's showing is that I thought I was going to get 50 bushels per acre. I only got 25, about 50% loss. And I pretty much had an 50% loss on, on the price expectation. Therefore, what I thought I was going to get, what I got, was a big difference, uh, hence the red $58,000 loss. And we'll calculate it again. Again, you can edit these. And, and more importantly, so the same thing for the organic spring wheat. You know, I, I, it was a significant uh, loss there. And you can see that if I'd bought the insurance at the 5000 or so dollars um, premium, I think, it, no, it's 4812 um, then um, I can see this is my actual income because of these loss was there. I, I went eighty-one thousand dollars below my estimated AGR. My loss is the you know after my deductible, so I went thirty-one thousand dollars under my loss inception, and then it's not quite the full payment there, but it's this loss payment. It's a little bit of a calculation there, and I would have gotten a twenty-eight thousand estimated. Again, this is estimation. Now this really note here thing here is what insurance people call moral hazard. Um, you will be, when you go to do a claim, you will be asked to justify your expenses. They basically, what they're trying to find out is you didn't deliberately screw the crop up by not, you know, by not doing due diligence and actually growing a crop. And, and one way they indicate that is if you're less than 70% of your average expenses that you've had on these crops in the past, then you're they, they fear that you may be in a moral hazard situation. So basically that's just put in there. And I want to remember that this is just for estimation. Again, all of this has to be worked through your, um, um, your crop insurance. So I can, again, play with this. I, we should also view the graph because these, these graphs are the best part of this. This actually probably is easier than me talking about it. And I'll put it in a larger graph. But as you can see, in this loss scenario, the farmer's income was moving up. He predicted it was going to be slightly less than he was the years before. Uh, so he insured, you know, that was his AGR, uh, just gross revenue, that, the, the revenue calculation. But his loss was here, and there's his loss inception point. So the difference between there, where he ended up, and his loss inception point is the indemnity payment. So graphically, you can see this very, very nicely. And uh, you can play these games all different ways. Um, and then finally, we go to, to the continued reports. Um, these are basic information that from all the information, it's all saved in there. It's nice. You can do this year after year after year. So every year, you don't have to re-enter all those tax information. It's kind of like TurboTax in that way. And you print all these reports out, take them to your insurance agents if you're going to buy it, and then it make it much easier for the insurance agents. I hope there's some insurance agents on the phone because I think this will really, really hamper that complexity issue if you have this. And I'll just put up one here just to show you what it looks like. This is actually the standard government form that would be need to be filled out by the insurance agent. Uh, and it will, don't, this won't, uh, if you're an insurance agent, don't just necessarily take this for bed. You need to work through the, the whole thing yourself. I mean, I, I think my tool is perfect and everything, but it's not perfect all the time. So you better um, check this, but at least this gives them the basis of that information and should make entry of data and buying the policy that much easier. So you just print that off and take that in to your insurance agency. And with that, I'm finished. Um, 
not too bad over. I wish we had a little more time, but um, we can go a little over and um, I'll take some questions about the product now. Good. Uh, thanks, Jeff. This, again, this is Jeff Berkby, and I've been uh, looking at some of the questions we've been receiving online that we'll talk about probably in the next 10 or 15 minutes. If people can stick around, we'll go through some of the questions. But before we get started on questions from our webinar attendees, um, we are being joined by Chris Mahalona, who is a risk management specialist with the USDA Risk Management Agency in Spokane. And his current duties focus on many of the unique commodities grown in Western Washington. Um, and he specialized with AGR and AGR Lite. So we're grateful to have him join us during this Q&A session. Chris, welcome to the webinar. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start out, maybe Jeff or Chris, I know you've both been, you've seen a lot over the years with AGR Lite. Um, do you have any success stories or things that come to mind about a, a farmer that really uh, had the premiums and, and did the due diligence and it really paid off for him after disaster? Does anything come to mind for either of you? Um, I, I, I have worked with farmers mostly that um, are looking into it as an insurance policy. There was only one farmer that actually had bought in it that I actually, we did an evaluation of. Um, <laughs> I'll be, uh, I'll be, I'll be on, on, honest and transparent. He actually used our tool and decided not to buy it the next year after, he, after using our tool because in his assessment of risk, it's a very interesting case. He basically said that he was fairly highly, more diverse than he had realized and that the, it gets back to this deductible premium cost. He thought that the premium was a bit too high for the level of diversity he actually had. And he thought that if he used other insurances uh, for specific crops that he would get better coverage. But hmm. that's the only case I know of, of uh, I mean, there, I know that there, there's six, seven, it's varied by year, six, 700 people using it. There are losses that are claimed uh, on their data. So but maybe Chris could speak to that. Um, well, we've had uh, the most experience out here in the Northwest with AGR and AGR Lite, and uh, it seems to have been accepted quite well as a risk management tool. And I do want to point out, if I got these numbers correct, Jeff, um, that the total liability there in your example was uh, $200,000 worth of coverage for uh, 4800 worth of premium, which actually, when you calculate it out, it's 2.4%, uh, and which is not too bad of a, a rate there. Mm -hmm. One thing, Jeff. Too, I think what you mentioned, the tool is as valuable perhaps to help farmers determine when, when this isn't a good program as well as what it is. And that's the value of the program on, on either side. Yeah. Um, another question I had um, was about people, there was some curiosity about, will this AGR light be rolling out more nationally? Is there an intent to try to have more coverage in, in the nation with uh, this product down the road? Um, I'll try to answer that question. And basically, when this first came out, it came out as a pilot. It was the big program in 1999. And the reasoning behind where it went was try to, to try to capture some of the diversity in agricultural commodities. And so then AGR Lite came out right about 2005, which was kind of a smaller toned down version. And so the, the pilot, the way it usually works, the pilot goes through an evaluation and then, um, then everything goes back to the agency and, and the uh, Federal Crop Insurance Corporation Board actually makes a decision as to what to do with the program. So it went through the evaluation and right now um, the agency is looking at combining these two programs um, provided the board approves it and if it comes out of a pilot phase then it will be um, available to uh, folks uh, around the country dependent on the filing of the programs and it's all this actuarial stuff that that uh, we as an agency need to do to put the program in a county so I would expect um, that may happen in the next year or two but but don't hold me to that. Uh, good. Uh, another question, a farmer asked his insurance agent about AGR light and his agent said that he felt it was too complicated and that there were better alternatives to look at. 
And how do we help farmers determine if AGR light versus other specialty crop insurance, which what's what the mix is, and maybe help them educate insurance agents that aren't up to speed on this. If you had any any feedback, well, you know, my, my, go ahead, Chris. I'll, I'll take it after you. It, it's been my experience in um, that most of the folks in the farming community understand um, AGR pretty good, and the the. Uh, I guess the time involved for uh, putting together a policy and, and things of that nature, it just takes a little bit of experience to to understand it and um, to know basically, you know, when you're looking at a farm situation to understand which questions to ask and the uh, to do proper underwriting of the uh, tax forms and whatnot. Um, so I don't know, it just, it takes a little bit of practice, I guess, uh, but uh, out here, you know, most folks uh, seem to have the hang of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, that's that's why we have the HR Light Wizard. I mean, the HR Light Wizard, in, in producing those reports, again, those reports have to be verified, so that's true, but it I would argue that a farmer going through, you know, thinking about AGR light, uh, I mean, which would first use the wizard, but have the data and information more or less collected accurately, could go into the insurance. It should be should take the complication, somewhat ease it. Uh, and it, I agree that there needs to be probably one thing we didn't do in this project enough was enough outreach to insurance agents, um, to, to with the tool and other. We were really concentrating on farmers. The, the other thing is, of course, when you have that multiple peril index, you can actually play, you can at least a little bit put in, you know, I, I took insurance on my corn and I'm going to do the rest with whole farm. That would actually give you a, a way to kind of combine the two. And I've actually done a little bit of experimentation with uh, looking at um, some cases where you could, again, it's really hard to know because of the particular farm, but if, if a farm has specialty crops that have specialty crop insurance available, uh, you know, they would have to weigh what is the value of their specialty crop that has other specialty crop insurance versus uh, the whole farm plan, which would include the other crops they grow, not just the specialty ones. So in other words, if you were really a blueberry producer and you're really only a blueberry producer and you have blueberry insurance, probably HRL like, wouldn't be. But if you were like a 50% blueberry uh, grower and the other 50% they came from a, a wide diversity of crops, HRL like, Only what combination? I mean, insurance is a kind of a strategy, a way of thinking of it. It's very strategic. You have to think of what you're growing and what's most valuable and what's what's actually what's creating the greatest volatility in your, your farm income, uh, what's most likely to go wrong. I mean, a lot of people use this for f different kinds of fruits. Fruits are highly variable in price and in yield and you know, are, are more susceptible to, to the kinds of things that affect yield and therefore tends to be used by people with fairly diverse fruit, for instance, because of that reason. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, maybe this one's for you. A, a farmer had a question about the, the uh, level of coverages under AGR light. And it seemed to him that you need to have a significant loss before receiving much of a payment. Are there plans by RMA to revisit the levels of coverage or calculate those or how is that level determined? Well, that, um, as I mentioned previously, going through the evaluation and whatnot, and I know there have been um, people that wanted a higher trigger level for the program. And so after it goes through the whole evaluation by the agency and, and looking at all the data, um, it, it'll have to be determined then. So there are no plans right now, but um, to increase the trigger level and the coverage, but I know it's it's been a concern by by some folks. Um, and after we go through the process of uh, merging these two programs, maybe it uh, would come up with a higher coverage level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, it, it is one of our recommendations to seriously pursue that. We do think that more farmers would use this product if the coverage, i.e. that deductible wasn't as high as it is. Um, but it is, I mean, and, and we also know, I also know knowing <laughs> spending these last four years with insurance is that that likely will also have to be, will probably lead to a higher premium cost because again, the higher the coverage, as you saw, even on the chart that was available, the higher the coverage, the higher the premium. So it, 
but it's a trade-off too. I mean, it, it is, um, it, it is, it's really just back to the whole deductible argument. What is the level of deductible people are comfortable with? And it is interesting because of the diversity factor here too, you know, really highly diverse farms, you know, that they, they, they feel that as they're more and more diverse, they're actually less risk. Therefore the premium should kind of drop as you add more and more crops because there's more and more way to disperse the risk. But, you know, it's all about actuarial science in a way too. Is that true or not? And, and the agency, by law has to you know make sure that these things do not get into serious problem and that, that i.e that there's more um, you know losses than, than there are revenue generating generating so you have to you know make up you don't want to be an insurance company be in that position and just just to add to that um, I, what Jeff uh, explained about the actuarial um, part of this and and RMA and all the programs that we have are bound by law that the dollars going uh, coming in has to, has to match the dollars going out. And so if you got, you know, twice as many dollars going out paying for claims, uh, then, you know, it would end up all the rates would be adjusted and then it might be. Uh... Mm -hmm. uh, we had a few questions about specific crops, and whether or not they were covered and um... We won't get into those in detail, but um, one question we had was from a, a, a farmer who operates a CSA where they have a shareholders or people buy shares of their crops every year. They were wondering if a, if a CSA is covered under AgriLite or if, the, if it's the crops themselves that are covered, how that works out. Uh, I'll answer that because we actually evaluated a couple CSAs in this program. Um, it's very hard. <laughs> First of all, community supported agriculture is kind of a share way of people basically are and really are buying a share of the farm. They're buying a share of the product of the farm at a certain uh, membership rate. So they're paying like $400 a year for a certain amount of vegetables coming out of the farm. It's a very unusual way of se selling because you're actually paying up front for crops that haven't even really been produced yet. Um, It'd be interesting to look at a, at a Schedule F of a CSA, for instance, just, just to see. I mean, they would still have gross sales because obviously they're still selling, even though they would basically be totaling their shares. Let's just say it was a pure CSA. That would be their gross sales. However, putting those intended reductions may be the, the, the really, then this was the problem for the CSA. CSAs tend to be highly diverse with like 40 different crops. And, and they would have to enter, first of all, all those different crops, or they could use the other vegetable category, which would probably raise the premium. But the other part of it that's very much, much more difficult to deal with is that intended production, where you're saying, what is the value per, you know, for, so if you've got green peppers, how do you break out the value of the share back into the value of the pepper? In other words, you're, you're, they're, they're buying the pepper. It's no doubt in the CSA they're buying that pepper, but they're buying that pepper in a very different way than if they're going to a farmer's market and selling it. So I really do think um, it's an interesting project, maybe another one to go on to, but it, it's very hard to see exactly how a CSA would work. Uh, I don't know if Chris has ever had any experience with a CSA actually trying to go through buying the insurance or not, but I think it gets complicated and it might be, it might be, uh, inordinately difficult for a CSA to actually use this insurance. Well, I, I, you know, I agree with with Jeff there that it can be uh, quite labor intensive to go through forty different crops, and I know a lot of the CSAs they say, okay, you get a box of stuff, right, uh, a mix of vegetables and whatever. So I guess you know that might be an option. Uh, it, a person would just have to work through it to say, okay, box other vegetables and then, you know, try to value it out somehow according to what the CSA is uh, charging for that box. Okay. Another question too, we, we talked a lot about uh, different vegetable crafts, but could you address any of the specific uh, issues that have come up about using AgriLite for livestock or small ruminants or specialty uh, um, fauna of some sort? Well, in basic terms, it again, it is the value of that production. It's just another another one of the intended 
commodities you intend to produce. Uh, so as you saw, there were eggs there and you would put in the eggs and the units of eggs. And sometimes the units could be difficult because some people sell eggs by crates, by dozen, by, but that you, that those are all allowed for in the, in the tool and you would actually incorporate it. Now, Chris, I have to remind me, I, I believe that if, if, if you're a purely a livestock farm, you, you wouldn't be eligible. Is that correct? I mean, you, you, you have, I think there's a certain gross, part of your gross revenue that if you go over, that's only, in other words, the, the crop insurance really isn't, it's not a livestock, but it does incorporate some livestock production up to a certain percentage value of the total. Is that correct, Chris? I always forget the, the, the thing. I mean, in other words, if I was just growing beef and I tried to, to, to use AGR light, I think I, I, I couldn't use it for that purpose. Is that right? The AGR pilot program had a, a limitation on livestock. The AGR light program has no limit on livestock. And so the, you know, as Jeff mentioned before, that AGR light can cover just about anything that's uh, crawling or, or growing on your farm. And the livestock is uh, most experienced that I've seen it, or uh, the livestock operations are kind of ancillary to their to their bigger operation. Um, and livestock is a little bit different because there's it, we didn't really talk about it too much. There's the inventory process in AGR and AGR light that uh, when you're looking at a tax form and you've got uh, say commodities that you produced last year that show up on this year's uh, taxes, uh, they have to be removed when you go through the loss situation. And likewise, if you've got commodities you produced uh, that didn't go on your, your tax forms, uh, they would have to be accounted for in, if you're in a loss situation. So the livestock operations side of that, um, it, it's a little bit uh, more complicated um, if anyone is familiar with uh, like, say like cattle, you always got critters going in and out of the herd, a replacement cattle and bull, we'll sell this bull and that. So it's a little bit more um, time intensive to, to capture all that information and get it down correct. Yeah. So there is no, I, I thought there was, it would be very rare. I, I thought it was maybe impossible. I'm, I'm sure it was rare that some of that only produced, let's say eggs or only produced eggs and broilers, uh, I guess there's nothing you're saying to inhibit them from using it. It may not be cost effective. Um, eggs and broilers would probably be e relatively easy to track the inventory of and deal with. But, but you're saying then that if it was just eggs and broilers, you could potentially use AGI for it. I've got to... I'm asking you, Chris, because I should know myself, but I don't. <laughs> um... Broilers is a, is a, a, a little bit different uh, commodity, and it was determined a while back that because uh, the chickens in in many broiler operations are not owned by the farmer, oh, that's that's the uh, other the issue. grower that they are mm. kind of uh, contract growers, and therefore right. there was a there question about insurable that. risk on that. So. But, but, for, but, but not, know, all, not all of those guys are contract growers either. Now no, I mean, if somebody has, contract. you know, 20, 30 chickens in their small right. farm, those are insurable. Okay. Okay. That's what mm -hmm. I'm doing. Thanks. So I've got uh, one more question from our listeners, and then I'll ask each of you for any final thoughts or, or assessments. And the, the final question I have is from a farmer who said, if, if he has a loss, if he gets AGR light insurance, and he, then he ha incurs a loss, What's what does he need to make a claim, and how long does it take to get payment for that loss? Yeah, it's well, I'll let Chris. I mean, we could spend a pretty long time on some of that because it is a pretty involved process for claims, as I understand. I haven't dealt much with that because I was more on the front end, worrying about trying to calculate premiums. But uh, you know, you really the, the rules that I've always been told: if you have in some some kind of insurable loss during your insurance year, you better get to your insurance agents and soon and report it. That's one thing that's just generally always helpful to do. Uh, the, other, the other thing is, is that this is one, one of the other barriers. You will not, even after you go through the process of making the claim and putting all the paperwork to make the claim, you, you need to actually file your tax forms for that intended year of production before you can get a claim. 
So the claim will take time because you not only have to do the process claim, but you actually have to, to have a uh, file tax form on which to base that, that thing. And that's one complaint that people say, well, that's too wait to, long to wait for my claim till I file my tax. Because as you know, many of us don't file our taxes on January 1st, we tend to go <laughs> to the deadline, right? And, uh, and that, that is an issue that people have, uh, but maybe Chris knows more of that. I haven't dealt as much with the other side of the claim side as he has, I know. Uh, yeah, you definitely, uh, Jeff was right there, you do have to get your taxes filed, and of course, this this insurance is, is quite a bit different than some of the other programs that runs on a tax year, and uh, so you're looking at revenue there, um, not bushels and things like that, so, and, and then uh, Jeff is also correct that if, if you think you have a loss, immediately contact your uh, agent and insurance provider because there are um, a lot of deadline restrictions by policy that if you don't meet those you could uh, potentially be in be in trouble and not be able to get paid under the program and then you just need to have you know if it's requested all the the documentation uh, to prove your loss uh, the proving the loss is the uh, the insured's responsibility if they say, hey, I lost money here or my crop got hailed on to be able to uh, substantiate that. And, and if it's requested to provide the uh, documentation of sales, lost revenue and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's it with questions. Um, Chris, I think maybe we'll, I'll start with you. And if, if you've got any final thoughts or anything you want to leave our audience with about the project or your perspective from the federal agency? Well, I think, and, and I appreciate uh, Jeff and all the folks uh, at NCAT and everybody else's help that uh, went into producing this tool because um, it, 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 it is different than the traditional RMA programs to multi I think uh, Jeff's done a good job with, with putting it together. And um, that's kind of my comment. <laughs> good, good. Um, Jeff, I'm not sure if we've lost you or not. Are you, are you there or did you- Can you hear you? me? Hello? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay. we can hear you. Yeah, Jeff. we did have a bit of a technical glitch there, it seemed. You all went to some all kind right. of weird noise making. <laughs> no. We're okay. Uh, Chris gave a little summary. So, Jeff, Good. if you have any final final things to add to the uh, about your thoughts on AgriLite? Yeah, I, I would just add. I mean, we had a. This was a been, been a very long and very interesting project for us. Um, uh, I learned a lot about software and software development that I never thought. I learned a lot about insurance. Um, one thing we have always, the, our major motivation and interest in this project is we're very into sustainable agriculture and diverse agriculture. And I really do think this product, even with all its limitations and problems that all insurances have, these, not, these you know, the one thing we should remember, you're, the problems and barriers to this insurance are, are, are still problems and barriers to other insurance policies. There's not all that much different between them, except what we're insuring, the revenue. But what we like is it seems to promote diversity. The idea is that you can insure that diversity and that diversity counts. And we're, we're, we believe actually uh, sustainable agriculture is tied to diversity. And so we're, we're encouraged by these kinds of, uh, of products that can help that diverse, um, multifaceted, you know, a person doing a very different kind of agriculture, maybe than just the standard commodity crops. And so that's what makes us very excited about this project and, and the product. And, and by the way, I will add, uh, for those who are still hanging in there, um, we have a follow up, a couple of follow up uh, grant projects where we will actually be including discussions of crop insurance, especially crop insurance in the future for the next year in several regions of the country. 
history, actually. And uh, I'm sure we'll have information about that on our website. We just were awarded them, so we are just gearing up. But uh, if you have interest in wanting us to come, uh, I'm particularly in the Midwest, Northeast, and Southeast regions, to hear more about this or to talk more about insurance, um, please contact me, and we may be able to do some outreach and education work in the future. Excellent. Well, thank you both uh, Jeff and Chris uh, for the presentation. I'll remind our audience again that this, this entire webinar is going to be archived and available online at atra.ncat.org. And usually those that are up within a couple of days, certainly by next week, that should be up on that website. So you can go through the uh, entire webinar at your leisure at a future time. On behalf of NCAT, and uh, thank you, Chris, with USDR RMA, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for the webinar, and uh, stay tuned for future webinars in the future. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Bye.